night beat starts right now and check out radar. It's remaining colorful tonight as storms continue to rumble across the area. It looks like some rumbling across the city right now. Meteorologist Katie Blake has the latest on your weekend forecast coming up. But first, a shift in power when it comes to reopening schools. Governor Greg Abbott sided with the attorney general's office, saying it's up to school boards, not public health officials, to decide when schools can reopen with in-person learning. San Antonio City Attorney saying they disagree with that interpretation. But does that mean local authorities can still stop schools from opening? Are you saying we can still stop them from opening the schools? Oh, uh, I'm no, we're, we're, we're Yes, actually, under the law, we could take this to the mad, but we're not. Instead of getting into a legal fight, the city is set to launch another tool to help with the decision for in-class learning. What you're going to see next week is an indicator of what our positivity rate is and whether or not it's a red light or a green light with regard to school opening. And ultimately, if the school board de defies that guidance, um, I, I'm sure parents are going to be calling that school board and calling those superintendents. That indicator and the requirement that schools report COVID-19 cases on campus are part of an amended public health directive expected next week. As we've seen a decline in hospitalizations, the system remains stressed and there continues to be community spread of the virus. This ties into the school conversation and we want to have schools open and then stay open. We need to keep on doing what we've been doing. That that includes mask wearing and social distancing. Messages the mayor says have been far from political. If the political bodies of those school districts, which have been seemingly empowered by the governor, decide to open schools in defiance of everything we know about this medical issue, then, you know, that's obviously a problem, but it's not something that we're going to be able to prevent, unfortunately. Mayor Ron Nuremberg says conversations with school districts in the area reflect they are keeping the safety of their students and staff in mind. Meantime, take a look at this. San Antonio ISD sharing this picture today of the face shield some students will be able to use. Face shields will be made available to students in pre-K through second grade. The district says the shields will stay at the school. They'll be sanitized and placed in the students' cubbies at the end of the day. Students will need to wear their face coverings on the way to school. Once they're in the classroom, they can use their face screen and wear it with or without a mask. Clear face masks will also be provided to students who are deaf or hard of hearing. And when it comes to COVID-19 here in Bear County, another decline in hospital admissions. 926 people hospitalized. 364 are in the intensive care unit. 252 are on ventilators. We now have 15% of staffed hospital beds available. That's another increase since yesterday. More than 500 COVID-19 cases were reported today, along with another two deaths. The death toll standing at 349. Today's seven day average in cases sits at 839. That's an increase in more than 35 cases since yesterday. The average coming in response to the city dealing with a lag in test results. The mayor is saying this week 12% of COVID-19 cases were for patients 18 and younger. COVID-19 triggering psychological effects in young children. Anxiety growing in those who test positive for the virus. Some fear they won't get to see their future. The night team Stephen Cavasso spoke to a 10 year old boy who worried his life would be cut short. I like to think that I was going to be OK, but like there's another part of me that was thinking I could die. MJ Borsvold faced with a difficult reality at just 10 years old. He and three other family members tested positive for COVID-19 back in June. His mother believes she and her husband brought the virus home to their children. MJ experienced chills, chest pain, and trouble breathing, but he feared what the virus would do to the people he loves most. The thing I was most scared of is like losing everything I have, like my family and my friends. Dark thoughts that clouded his bright future. But Ashley Jesse, a licensed professional counselor, believes feelings like MJ's are actually normal. It tends to go the way our minds work, it tends to go to the worst case scenario. Jesse says people experience anxiety when going through the unknown, but past experiences with death and trauma could lead to deeper issues. Jesse says children can regress, act out, or become socially withdrawn. She urges parents to be aware of a change in their child's behavior. 
those are also signs that can signal that they may need to talk to a professional counselor. You know your child. She says the best parents can do is talk openly about their feelings. And despite the rise in COVID-19 cases, parents should reassure their kids that they will be okay. Just because you're sick with a scary illness doesn't mean you're going to die. MJ has fully recovered and says he's grateful for his family's support, but he wants to remind others it's okay to be scared. Uh, for like people that are just like super worried, it's fine. It's a very scary virus. According to data on the city's website, 15% of COVID-19 cases are people under the age of 19, and the majority of kids that do test positive are over the age of 10. Now, health experts say that children that do test positive for COVID-19 don't get as sick as adults, but they should still self-isolate. For now reporting, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. COVID-19 testing is expanding in San Antonio. A total of three walk-up sites will be open for all of August beginning tomorrow. Two locations are at the Cuellar Community Center on San Fernando Street and the Ramirez Community Center off Gillette Boulevard. They do not require an appointment and are open daily from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The Freeman Coliseum will remain open as well. This testing site does require an appointment and runs from 9 a.m to 4 p.m. Meanwhile, another vaccine study happening in our area. Moderna began testing for its COVID-19 vaccine. Clinical Trials of Texas is also leading this study, as well as the Pfizer study that began yesterday. Moderna's study is set to last two years, with some participants receiving the vaccine and others a placebo. Each participant is asked to document their experience. Everybody can look at the data now in real time and really do it as quickly as possible so that decisions can be made whether or not to approve this vaccine and make it available for our population to receive hopefully early next year. Around 400 people are scheduled to participate in the study over the next several weeks. Down to a rain cooled 75 degrees in San Antonio and essentially all of our reporting sites have a temperature in the 70s right now because of rain. So really great to see this on radar. We still do have some strong storms out there tonight, especially down to the southwest LaSalle County and Catula and uh, just to the north of Brackettville out in Kenny County. Some strong storms still ongoing here in and around San Antonio. Some really light rain and also some rumbles of thunder remain and you may hear some more rumbles of thunder through the overnight hours. We'll talk about what you can expect this weekend coming up in just a few minutes. We'll dive into radar a little bit more as well. Steve. Thank you, Katie. Nursing homes still struggling to contain the coronavirus. The latest numbers from the state show 73 COVID-19 deaths in Bear County nursing homes. According to Metro Health, there are currently at least 25 nursing homes with active outbreaks. Windsor Mission Oaks Nursing and Rehabilitation Center on the south side is still being monitored. The night team's Tiffany Huerta spoke with the family of a U.S. Air Force veteran who died of COVID-19 and lived at that very nursing home. He instilled a very deep sense of loyalty, you know, to the United States of America uh, for his service. U.S. Air Force veteran Teodoro Laurel was buried at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery last week. The biggest things that we've learned out of my dad and being taught from my father was being respectful and, and loyal. Uh, to not only your country, but also your family. Teodoro's son, Teodoro Laurel Jr., says his dad lived at Windsor Mission Oaks. Laurel Jr. says his dad took several COVID-19 tests. Ultimately testing positive for COVID-19 and on the day of his, his passing at the hospital. The COVID-19 outbreak at Windsor Mission Oaks was announced on July 9th, one day before he died. There were many things Laurel Jr. says he wished he'd known. They didn't explain into detail that there was an outbreak going on. They didn't go into detail about exactly how many cases and how many deaths had occurred. The city reports 91 residents have tested positive for COVID-19 at Windsor Mission Oaks and five have died. 51 staff members have tested positive. Windsor Mission Oaks says it follows CDC guidelines. Residents who test positive are immediately isolated and the staff members are sent home and do not return until medically cleared. 
Dr. Jun De Wu with Metro Health says it's taking weeks for nursing homes to receive COVID-19 results. She says you can't stop transmission if it's taking that long. Wu says the federal government is sending rapid antigen tests to local nursing homes in hopes of improving that turnaround time. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. It's still ahead on the night beat, a glimmer of fiesta set to happen tomorrow. How you can participate in a drive through event that will help the San Antonio Food Bank. And a house fire in Stone Oak sends heavy smoke into the air. Firefighters now believe they've pinned down a cause in that case. And a jail escape that began 12 stories in the air. The chase that took place on the ground next on the night beat. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. A murder suspect able to break out of jail despite being on the 12th floor of the building. It happened in Oklahoma this morning where jail officials say two inmates broke a window, then shimmied down using linens. One wow. inmate broke his leg and was caught. The other was 34 year old Pablo Robledo, who was able to get away, but was eventually caught a short time later. Cameras caught him being walked back into jail. Well, here at home, the San Antonio Fire Department believes lithium batteries are the cause of a house fire on Mellow Oak in the Stone Oak area. The fire broke out this afternoon, and when crews arrived, they saw heavy smoke from a ceiling over the garage. A resident in the home says he was charging lithium batteries for his drones and RC cars when a spark set a bookcase on fire. Everyone inside made it out of the burning home safely. Damages are estimated at $70,000. With Fiesta canceled, some are taking it upon themselves to keep tradition alive while helping others. Tomorrow is your chance to get a medal, a Fiesta medal, while helping local families amid this pandemic. Fiesta Castle Hills will be selling hundreds of medals to help raise money for the San Antonio Food Bank. The 2020 medals will be sold for $5 each. Past medals will be $1 each. They hope to raise at least $1,000. We just hope that everybody comes out tomorrow and supports our efforts. Uh, you know, a lot of people do love to collect medals. And just so they know that this will definitely be going to the food bank, which is in need of, of funds for food for uh, San Antonians and people around. The volunteers will be wearing masks and gloves at tomorrow's drive through event. It's happening tomorrow from 9 in the morning till noon. It'll be at the Commons of Castle Hills, which is off Lemonwood Drive. It seems the Republican race for Congressional District 23 is not over yet. Today, Raul Reyes announced he will seek a recount following a very narrow margin in votes between himself and Tony Gonzalez. It comes days after Gonzalez declared victory. The district stretches from San Antonio to El Paso and includes 29 counties. The Reyes campaign has until Monday to submit the petition and pay their deposit for that recount. We've got a traffic alert tonight. This one's over on the northwest side of San Antonio near Bernie. TxDOT issued a full closure of westbound I-10 between Ralph Fair Road and Old Fredericksburg. Crews started the closure just a few minutes ago at 10 o'clock tonight. They plan to keep it closed until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. TxDOT will be making roadway improvements to that area. SpaceX took them to space, and now those NASA astronauts are set to come back to Earth this weekend. That's if the weather permits it. Robert Bankin and Douglas Hurley are the first astronauts to travel into orbit aboard a commercial, commercially developed spacecraft. They've been on board the International Space Station for two months after launching in the SpaceX Crew Dragon from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It was the first crewed mission to take off from U.S. soil in nearly a decade. Their spacecraft is nicknamed Endeavor. For the most part, we've had pretty good, uh, pretty good luck with with Endeavor as far as uh, on orbit testing. It's performed just like it did for launch uh, and uh, rendezvous. So we expect nothing different for the splashdown. Splashdown is set for Sunday afternoon, but Hurricane Isaias is headed to Florida possibly causing winds and high waves at all of the possible landing sites. NASA plans to move forward, but teams will continue monitoring the weather before undocking on Saturday night. 
All right, Katie Blake, I've got to admit it. When I heard you say that the temperatures are down in the 70s right now, I'm like, I'm going to go outside. Yes. Just real quick, can I see Enjoy it while you just, can. Just so I can remember what this feels like. It is still mucky, though. So All there's right. that. But we, I mean, we get, we're getting some light rain out of it now. I, I decided I'll wait till after the show. Okay, fine. <laughs> Don't want to mess up your hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, not great weather for the hair out there right now, but we are getting some light rain and we will take it. Nice to have that thunder shower activity out there today, and it always yields some nice KSAT Connect pictures. You guys, guys did a great job with the lightning picks today. This the view from Castroville. This the view from here in San Antonio. Taylor, this is a great picture. Uh, Woodlawn Lake, look at that. That's, that is fantastic. Thank you so much for that picture. And another great picture, look at all this lightning. It was definitely a light show out there this evening. Uh, this is the view from San Antonio. Thank you for that photo, Richard. As far as rainfall totals go, we'll probably have a more comprehensive rundown of these uh, rainfall totals for you, even as early as tomorrow morning on Good Morning San Antonio. But some of this rain has been quite heavy. I know we didn't necessarily see that in and around San Antonio in Bear County, but some spots radar estimates have gotten between one and two inches of rain and a lot of the kind of bullseye spots here were maybe even two to three inches of rain fell over the past 12 hours. That's up in the aquifer recharge zone. That is some really, really good news. Now we'll do a little bit of hand tracking here, so I'm going to set down this uh, second clicker really quickly. We've still got a ton of lightning uh, generally well off to the west in Kenny County. They're off to the east of Del Rio and down in LaSalle County and Catula. Uh, but I do want to show you really quickly if you're hearing some thunder in and around San Antonio and Bear County, we do have some lingering light rain and some lightning strikes showing up. So even if it's not, you know, a torrential downpour out there, uh, we are picking up some lightning strikes. So a few rumbles of thunder definitely not out of the question, even as we head into the overnight hours. This is generally just some light rainfall over into northern Medina County. Uh, we do have some thunder showers still in a portion of Edwards County near Rock Springs, uh, and this is a pretty strong storm uh, that's moving through Kinney County right along Highway 90 in Brackettville there. Obviously a lot of lightning. A uh, weather service thinks there could be some smaller hail in here. Nothing too big that it would do any damage, but you may get a little bit of hail there uh, in Brackettville, and that is fairly close. There we go. Uh, this will be moving south south into Brackettville here very shortly and crossing the Highway 90 corridor. Uh, farther to the south, we're going to zoom back out here so we can go down to uh, the Catula area in LaSalle County because there are still some strong storms down 35 as well. And just to show you how electrified these storms still are, a ton of lightning here south of Pleasanton in southern Atascosa County and also down in LaSalle County and Catula. Generally, LaSalle County, you're pretty much covered in rain right now. That's uh, not a bad thing. And while a lot of this rain is quite heavy, it's moving along pretty quickly quickly and so that's going to uh, keep us out of any flash flooding issues tonight and and that's good news. We'll always take that. That's for sure. Our high res models have really struggled with this activity this evening. I think they're starting to get a better grip on what's going on, but generally what you can expect over the next few hours, a few lingering rumbles of thunder and um, maybe some continued heavy rain if you're along and west of the I 35 corridor down to the south places like Catula. You're getting that very heavy rain right now. You could continue to see some rounds of heavy rain as those uh, heavier cells move down to the southwest of 35. If you're here in San Antonio and Bear County, generally just some lingering light rain and rumbles of thunder for the next few hours. By tomorrow morning, things should be pretty quiet and most of your Saturday will be quiet. But tomorrow afternoon during the heat of the day, we could see some isolated thunder showers pop back up. I think mainly south of Highway 90 uh, late tomorrow afternoon into the early part of the evening. So don't be alarmed if you hear rumble of thunder tonight. Lingering thunder showers possible. Temperatures falling down into the low 70s. We're in the mid 70s now. They could certainly drop off a few more degrees through early tomorrow morning. Depending on how the activity behaves tonight, can't rule out a lingering shower early tomorrow morning, but then it'll be tomorrow afternoon during the heat of the day that some more isolated activity could pop back up and we'll see a very similar story Sunday into Monday of next week as our weather pattern remains a bit more unsettled. Coming up later in the newscast, of course, we'll look at radar once again, but we've also got a lot going on in the tropics, so we'll look at look at that as well, guys. Thank you, Katie. All right, they're on. The season is reopened officially in San Antonio. Can we say that? Yeah, and game on. And for Derek White, remember, they put him in the starting lineup for yeah. his defense. It paid off tonight. He took a record five charges tonight in one game. In fact, at one point, I think he was checking his teeth to make sure they all were all there. When we come back, we'll show you how they did it and saying goodbye to Bryce.
Spurs and Kings locking arms tonight, taking a knee during the national anthem as they restart their NBA seasons in Orlando. But Spurs head coach Greg Popovich and assistant Becky Hammond choosing to stand next to their team. Now down to basketball. Pop sticking with his young starting lineup tonight in game one of the eight that count. Derek White owned the first quarter, first showing his outside range as he extended it with back-to-back -back three pointers. And then inside, thanks to DeMar DeRozan feeding White for the slam. He finished with 10 in the first quarter. And Rudy Gay caps off a 19 to nothing run to give the Spurs a 16 point lead and after one the Spurs are up 43 30 now in the second quarter Lonnie Walker the fourth getting the start and the throwdown but the Kings erases 16 point lead with this basket by Bogdan Bogdanovich and the Spurs are down one at the half 65 64 now in the fourth we're tied at 112 all when Walker gets a bank shot to fall and that's when DeMar takes off he scores 10 of the Spurs last 13 including this basket that made it 116 to 112 to lead the Spurs to victory 129 to 120 DeRozan led the Spurs with 27, White matching his career high tonight with 26. We're just trying to attack, um, be aggressive, stick to our strengths. I mean, DeMar, he's going to do what he does. He does a great job of keeping us together, uh, finding us when we're open. So we got Yaka, but a lot of people out there that make it easy for us and um, just every time make a right play and make a good shot. All right, that was an important game. The next one is two since they're only eight. That's against Memphis, who holds the eighth and final playoff spot. Sunday at three in Orlando. Dallas Cowboys have taken all the precautions they can to open up their first ever training camp at their headquarters in Frisco. These are photos provided by the team at the socially distanced facilities, including temperature check stations, every other locker, safety tags that alert players that they are too close inside the facilities, meeting rooms where they have removed half of the chairs with visual reminders to wash their hands, and inside the star where the seats have been covered to prevent usage as well. The Houston Texans holding their first press conference since they opened their training camp in Houston this week. Head coach Bill O'Brien answering questions today. And of course, the first is about player and staff safety during the COVID-19 pandemic. And more specifically, what is the challenge of coaching during this health crisis that has hit Houston like San Antonio very hard for himself and his family and coming to work with players during these unprecedented times? The McNairs uh, ha have invested a lot of money in the improvements and what it took what it was going to take to get this building ready. And, uh, you know, it's, I think the players are impressed with that. I think we have a good schedule. We've broken the team up into five different teams. And so uh, guys are staggered coming into the building and, and the weightlifting staggered and the training rooms. We have three different training rooms. And then eventually we'll all end up on the field at the same time. But the scheduling has been monumental task. But I feel like we're off to the you know, we're off to a good start with scheduling. Now, Brian was also asking about Patrick Mahomes' record-setting $503 million contract extension would affect the talks between the Texans and Deshaun Watson, getting the extension for him. All O'Brien would say is that they love Deshaun and want him around for a long time. We learned something through Bryce today. There's a reason why we celebrate Bryce today. We celebrate Bryce today because he saw his adversity, he fought it, and he conquered it. So to the young people watching here today, I'll say this to you. I know you didn't get a proper graduation. <laughs> so I'll say this to you. From what I learned from my little brother Bryce, if you want to be great, and there's going to be times you don't know what to do, where to go, how do I do this, how do I do that. If you want to be great, look, go and find and seek your adversity. Because on the other side of that is your opportunity to be great. Wow. A private funeral service was held today at the Agape Christian Church on Judson Road to say goodbye to Bryce Wisdom. He's a former Judson football player who lost his two-year battle with kidney cancer this past Sunday, but not before he inspired so many others worldwide, including former Jets, now Seattle Seahawks safety Jamal Adams, who phoned Bryce in the hospital before he passed away. He is dedicating his season in Seattle to Wisdom, who inspired the sayings of Bryce Strong and live like Bryce. Bryce Wisdom leaves us at 17. Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred is threatening to shut down the season as early as Monday if teams do not get a better job of getting the coronavirus under control. His threat coming less than 24 hours after two more players tested positive on the St. Louis Cardinals after as many as 21 members of the Marlins organization tested positive for COVID-19. State and local government officials have expressed concern that players have been violating mandates set forth in the league's 113-page operation manual during the pandemic, including high-fiving, spitting, and not wearing masks. The Cardinals game against the Brewers was postponed tonight, and according to ESPN, 
Management. Manfred told Players Association Executive Director Tony Clark if the sport doesn't do a better job of managing the coronavirus, he will shut it all down on Monday. So this is a huge weekend for Major League Baseball if they want to see the 60-game season continue. Hard to believe it could be the last weekend. They just got started. Unbelievable. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. We're going to take you really quickly to some breaking news on the city's northeast side. You're looking at a shot from Transguide of I-35 and Salado Creek right now. Yeah, traffic backed up near Kirby and the W.W. White Road exit. I believe it's the northbound lanes of I-35 that you're looking at, but you can see completely shut down the access road at a crawl. We're not exactly sure what happened here, what's exactly going on, but you can see San Antonio police are certainly here. We've reached out to police for more information on exactly what's happening. We'll let you know when we find out. We'll be right back. It is our KSAT Q&A where we try to separate the fact from some of the fiction that is out there. And all through this pandemic, a spotlight has definitely been shown on Metro Health. And we are joined by Metro Health's director, Dr. Colleen Bridger, assistant city manager as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my big question today is, what did you take from the governor's order that basically says that Metro Health across, that health directors across the state cannot preemptively close down schools? Well, I think it's important to uh, mention that our city attorneys don't agree with their interpretation of state law, but we're not looking to get into any sort of fight. And so we will um, revise our order so that it provides guidance to school boards um, and provides data for them to look at as they are now making the decision about whether to um, provide schools to provide school in the buildings or virtually. And you mentioned that guidance and, and uh, Mayor Nirenberg mentioned in his briefing today that that will be put out next week. Can you give us some insight into what that guidance will look like? And then do you anticipate any problems with school districts actually following it? So the guidance is going to be very metric focused. So um, we have created an index that combines several different data sources um, and then scales it for red, yellow, and green. Um, and so depending on where each of these metrics are will be what the color of the index is. And then the guidance that goes along with that color. So for example, if it is red, then the guidance is to offer as many classes and as many services as virtually as possible um, will help them make their decisions about whether or not to bring students back on campus. And do you anticipate schools following it? Do you, do you foresee any problems? I anticipate the majority of the superintendents and school boards um, will follow the health authorities guidance. Yes. Okay. We talked about how you know really Metro Health has been under a magnifying glass like I've never seen it before in the 25 years I've been here in San Antonio. Uh, people uh, questioning whether contact tracers were hired soon enough. People questioning funding uh, for Metro Health. Uh, how do you view that criticism and being in the spotlight that you are at Metro Health. Yeah, I mean, that that's that's how I'm feeling, too. I've been a health director for 25 years and I have never experienced anything like this before. And, you know, we've had Ebola, we've had H1N1, we've had Zika, we've had a number of things that have been fairly high profile. Um, none of them have been this intense. None of them have lasted this long and none of them resulted in as much criticism um, being directed at public health employees um, as I've ever experienced. So, so yes, it's, it is really hard to um, simultaneously respond to a hundred year pandemic while also responding to criticism and 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 some of the criticism is is uh, well deserved and we have modified our response um, in order to better you know take that criticism into account and, and make us better um, but some of it is 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 politically motivated you know you're you're um, either either we're overestimating or we're underestimating the case count 
um, depending on which side of the aisle you're on. It, it feels pretty political sometimes and public people aren't used to that. We're really not political beings. And so that's a little bit more difficult for us to understand and deal with. What's the biggest issue you see moving forward? I know for a while it seemed like people not wearing masks was one of them, and it seems now people are wearing them. What do you foresee moving forward as being the biggest obstacle? Is it contact tracing or these mandates from the state that get in the way of what local officials are trying to do? What, what, do, you, what do you think that is? I've been saying from the beginning of this pandemic that the real solution to the problem is to get people to agree that they need to change their behaviors for the long term. And that's never easy. That's something public health talks about a lot, and that's never easy. Um, but we're a long way from a vaccine, and we can't stay holed up in our houses for 12 months. Um, so we need to get people to understand the importance of not just wearing a mask, but maintaining that social distancing, um, continuing to wash their hands. And this is the most important piece and seems to be one of the more difficult pieces for Americans, which is if you don't feel well, stay home. Um, we are just tough and we are going to get out there and we're going to work even if we aren't feeling that's what's really spreading this virus and we need people to be okay with the fact that they can stay home when they're not well. There are a lot of conspiracy theories out there and the most prevalent seems to be that people who don't test positive for COVID-19 or being counted in the COVID numbers and maybe the COVID deaths and that people are being counted twice. I've seen that one as well in the questions that we've received. Clarify some of that for me if you would. I would love to. So there are essentially two reputable kinds of COVID-19 tests. One of them is called a PCR test that looks for genetic material um, of the virus. One of them is an antigen test and that looks for the protein that attaches to that genetic material. Um, the PCR test is 100%, that is the gold standard. Um, the antigen test is a newer test. If you test positive with an antigen test, and, and most people know that as the 15 minute test, if you test positive with that, you have COVID-19. The only time the antigen tests are less reliable are with the negative results. So we count people who have a positive PCR test or genetic test and people who have a positive antigen test. So if you have a positive test for COVID-19, that's either PCR or antigen, you get counted as a case. We do not count you if you are a positive antibody test because antibody tests don't tell us anything. Um, we do not count you if you are a close contact but haven't been tested. So the only way you get into our case count is if you have had a positive COVID-19 test. Dr. Colleen Bridger, Assistant City Manager and Interim Director of Metro Health, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be right back. The U.S. seeing signs of hope as two vaccines enter their final testing stages. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying today he remains optimistic when it comes to seeing a vaccine in the next year. But the short-term forecast for the country still remains grim. The CDC out with a dire prediction for the next few weeks. ABC's Zareen Shaw has the story. Tonight, a positive sign as two vaccines make it to the final testing stage. One of the volunteers for Pfizer's is a Louisiana doctor taking on the risk herself after seeing multiple patients not make it. A vaccine is really what offers some hope uh, to try to uh, end you know, so much of the suffering. Dr. Anthony Fauci today testifying on Capitol Hill saying he feels positive. We feel cautiously optimistic that we will have a vaccine by the end of this year and as we go into 2021. For some, that vaccine cannot come soon enough. Students in Georgia starting to return back to school. Safety measures are in place, but masks are not required. I have full confidence that they have put in all the right protocols. Yet at a sleepaway camp in Georgia where campers did not wear masks, within one week, over 44% of campers and staff got the virus. 
The CDC predicting the coronavirus death toll could jump by another 30,000 in the next three weeks, reaching 182,000. Florida hitting its fourth straight day of breaking a record for lives lost. Loriana Hernandez Aldama says her family there just had moments to say bye to her 94-year-old father-in-law over video chat. They called us at 6 o'clock. We were able to talk to him until 619. And they said that his blood pressure was going down. And by 630, we lost him. Many families fearing losing so much financially now, too. 30 million Americans receiving their final $600 weekly federal unemployment benefit last week. Congress and the White House not appearing close to another solution. This Chicago bartender says the $600 was keeping her afloat. Being able to have a roof over my head, being able to have food to eat. We are out here drowning. We are struggling. Here in California, the health department confirmed the first teenager dying of COVID-19. The person had underlying conditions and was from the Central Valley, which has seen a surge in cases. Zorian Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. Parents and teachers are worried about how they'll make sure students still get a good education during the pandemic. Now they've come together online using the Facebook group Corn Teach San Antonio. The creator of the group tells Alicia Barrera their purpose is to make sure teachers are ready for the new school year. The end of the 2019-2020 school year definitely proved to be stressful for parents who had to work from home, but also play teacher's aid. That way they could make sure that their student was really learning. But this go around, teachers and parents want to make sure that it goes way smoother, which is how quarantine comes into the picture. So what exactly is Teach? It's an online community open to all on Facebook, and their parents and educators toss around ideas to help navigate online school, homeschool, and everything in between. Through the group, parents can hire private certified instructors or just simply be able to relate to others and know that they're not alone. This original corn teach was started in Houston, but here in San Antonio, a former NEISD teacher and mom of three, Kendall Aljabori, created the group. And it was about a month ago, and already there are close to 1,200 educators and parents ready to work together to make it a successful school year. According to the rules of this Facebook group, it's a politics-free zone simply to ask questions and share advice on how to succeed educationally during quarantine. And some of the top questions and topics that you can find there include hiring a teacher that can come to the student's home. Teachers are also offering after school tutoring and some again simply finding that there are others in the same exact situation. I think that if you join Quarantine San Antonio that you post your story. How many kids do you have? What grades? any concerns you have um, because people are answering and giving really heartfelt advice and it's just I think helping a lot of people get more confidence for this upcoming school year. And parents and teachers in case you're wondering what are some school supplies that could really help students during quarantine. A popular one that worked for parents in the group is a whiteboard or post-it notes. And Kendall says that any parent or educator are welcome to join the group and ask questions and again share this advice. For a link to that Facebook group, you can head over to ksat.com. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Take a live look outside right now with uh, live cam. 75 degrees out there. Temperatures falling and uh, so is the stuff from the sky. Kate. Yes, a little bit of a light to moderate rainfall across San Antonio. We will take that. That is for sure. Uh, we'll have some really fresh rainfall totals for you tomorrow morning once all of this clears on out because Formally, the airport has only picked up a trace of rain, and I think with what's falling now, that will go uh, up, and that will only be valid till midnight, but I think formally today we'll get out with a little bit more than a trace of rain. We will get right back to radar, but I do want to start you off with an update on what's going on in the tropics. A lot going on there. Hurricane Isaias is still churning tonight. Maximum sustained winds are up to 80 miles per hour with this uh, Category 1 hurricane. It is expected to maintain its Category 1 status as it comes very close to the Florida coastline over the course of the weekend. Now, if you're in eastern Florida, really anywhere in Florida, uh, you're watching this like a hawk because while most of the storm is expected to stay offshore, certainly could still feel some effects from the 
tides, the storm surge, the winds there. So uh, it's going to be a close call uh, for the east coast of Florida. However, as we get into Monday, it does look like Isaias could affect portions of the Carolinas, uh, maybe even to Virginia and parts of the northeast. So this will be something that we'll continue to watch for several more days. So there is Isaias, but we've got Two more areas of interest out in the Atlantic Basin. Tropical Depression 10 is out near uh, the coast of Africa there. It's not expected to do a whole lot. It's actually not even expected to become a named storm, so no worries there. Another disturbance at the Hurricane Center is watching. That's still off to the east of the Caribbean. Odds of development in the next five days, 30%, so it bears watching. And uh, friendly reminder that hurricane season is well underway. I'm going to step out and let you see the time lapse from today. It's pretty cool because uh, you can see when the sky started to turn a bit more dark and when things started to get a bit windy as that strong outflow boundary came on through 99 at the airport before temperatures fell. And uh, like I mentioned, we did only formally record a trace of rain at San Antonio International today. So while we've got really just some good sleeping weather going in and around San Antonio right now, it is still quite noisy uh, across parts of the viewing area. And I do want to give some of our uh, other communities an idea of what is going on. Strongest cluster of storms is down to the south here in southern Atascosa County, uh, down into a portion of LaSalle County. Catula, it looks like the worst of it is moving away from you now, but I do want to give you an idea of how this is moving generally down down to the south and to the east. So Catula again, worst of it is past you. Same for Carrizo Springs. This will continue uh, to drop south over the next couple of hours and really quickly before we uh, switch gears here. There was a strong storm that just moved through Brackettville and Kenny County. That will be dropping into northern Maverick County, though Eagle Pass, the worst of that storm, should stay uh, well to the east of you over the next couple of hours. But generally speaking, the consensus tonight will be that this activity will gradually wind down, but you will certainly be possible that you'll hear some rumbles of thunder overnight for a few more hours. As we get into tomorrow afternoon, heat of the day could spark some more isolated showers and non-severe storms across a portion of the area. Not everyone will see rain tomorrow or on Sunday, but there is a chance for uh, some more beneficial rainfall for a lucky few yards. So tonight, lingering thunder showers down to the low 70s. Tomorrow afternoon, We'll get some sunshine going. That'll warm us up into the upper 90s and a 20% chance of a thunder shower tomorrow, 30% chance on Sunday. And as we get into the middle of next week, the heat high builds back in and that will cut off our rain chances. So we'll take it while we can get it. Guys. All right. Thanks so much, Katie. Your night beat in review is up next. The pandemic has forced many to think outside the box to come up with strategies to move us forward in life. Whether that be in the form of treating COVID-19 or going to school. Here's this week's Night Beat in Review. Put an over-the-counter supplement ease the symptoms of COVID-19. A Medina County doctor is using melatonin in addition to other medication to help patients recover from the virus faster. He says melatonin won't kill the virus, but it seems to help manage the symptoms. I'm actually getting more and more colleagues who actually have tried it, and I'm getting lots of feedback that says, wow, this stuff really does work. Dr. Ruth Berggren with UT Health San Antonio says there's promise in two clinical trials. They're giving those healthcare workers either two milligrams of melatonin at bedtime or a placebo or a sugar pill and they're monitoring them for 12 weeks and they're going to look to see if there's any difference in the rate of getting infected or if people do get infected. She warns people not to take melatonin in high doses without talking to their physician first. Education continues to see rapid changes amid this pandemic. Some saying the governor has not done enough in his announcement for the star test. Governor Greg Abbott says students in fifth and eighth grade will not be required to pass the star test in order to move to the next grade level. Well, just like manufacturers were not prepared for the rush of people buying toilet paper during the pandemic, aluminum can makers were not ready either. At Alamo Beer Company, located in the east side, brewmaster Greg Spickler believes more people are drinking at home during the the pandemic. We have a hard time getting our 12 ounce sleek cans because of the seltzer craze. Um, but as far as our 12 ounce uh, standard beer can, we're able to get those right now at the moment um, because we're getting a blank can and we're putting a label on it. Um, if we were a brewery who had a printed can, 
we would be experiencing some extremely long lead time. A liftoff to a new world. Today, NASA launched its rover Perseverance, which will travel 65 million miles to Mars. Philip Hargrove, a San Antonio native, helped make that launch possible. Working at NASA has been a dream come true for this San Antonio native. Work that he says isn't easy, but serves a purpose in the world. It's, it's science for the sake of science um, and science for the sake of benefiting humanity. And his advice for young San Antonians, ask questions and search for answers. Follow the things that your curiosity takes you to and then like persevere.